This morning, I want you to take your Bible go to 2 Timothy. Well, that's where we are this morning. But that leaves us Hebrews and 2 Peter. Leaves us 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation, and we're done. So, uh, so the end is in view, the finish line's in sight. We're, we're, we're going to be there sooner than you think. This morning we're in 2 Timothy, and I, I want to read for us chapter 1 of this letter of Paul, what we think is Paul's final letter. 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul writes this, I, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. For I'm mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and then your mother Eunice, and I'm sure that it is in you as well. And for this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death, and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. But I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Retain the standard of sound words which you've heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, the treasure which has been entrusted to you. You're aware of the fact that all who are in Asia are turned away from, among whom are Phagellus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the house of Anesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. The Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well what services he rendered at Ephesus. A couple of months back, uh, Barb and I went into Washington, D.C. to spend some time with our son, Jonathan, there. And um, as is often the case when we go, he, he says, Dad, Mom, what, what would you like to see while you're here? And we said, Jonathan, I, you, you make recommendations. You, you live there. You, you tell us what, what we should see, and he knows where we've been. And, and so this time, he took us out to Mount Vernon. It was the first time I'd ever been there, Barbara had ever been there. Uh, it, it was very interesting, really enjoyable. Uh, we uh, wandered around George Washington's house, uh, his grounds, the grounds, the farm, the things that uh, were true, uh, and, and they still do some things there on the, pro on the premises. Uh, it, it was very enlightening and educational. And, and uh, let me, they actually, as part of a visitor center, they have a, a, a museum type thing that you would walk through with exhibits, and uh, learned a lot of things about uh, George Washington, the man, and learned about uh, things uh, of his preparation 
as a general and then his role as president and even his post-presidency. And like every good museum, when you get to the end, you know what's there waiting for you, don't you? The gift shop. They got a large one. And uh, there were some very interesting books and stuff there. And I ordered them from Amazon when I came back home. <laughs> they were a little cheaper. But there were some things that were, again, very en enlightening and uh, educational and things I learned about him. One of the things that, that struck me was his farewell address. Um, it's become customary now, as presidents are leaving office, that they may give a farewell address to the nation. And, uh, rooted in Washington's farewell address. It's not very long, which would be a good hint for some of the other presidents. <laughs> when I was reading that, it struck me the things that are in there. Certainly, you learn something about the man. You learn something about his character, his humility, uh, how he he understood that the role that he'd had as president, uh, the responsibility that it wasn't something that he had really looked to. And, and certainly he could have stayed on as president longer. Uh, but how he graciously realized that was not the best and stepped aside. And so you learn something of his character. You learn something of what kind of man this was. And, and, and in that address, he, he you learn something of his great passion for the country and what he desired and things like a, a real sense of the union, the union of the states. Uh, you got to remember that this is the end of the 18th century, that there weren't that many states. And yet this tremendous burden for a sense of union amongst these groups of people, these states, um, and, and with that, a tremendous defense of the Constitution, to guard the Constitution, the dangers that, that might arise. He, he also talks about the necessity of religion and morality, the basis of virtue that, that, that the country, the survivor, could not be an enduring survival without virtue, which is found in the religion and moral. Hey, you, you see this desire for the country in his farewell address, those things that he wants to see continue on in this fledgling land that is called the Great Experiment. There, there are a number of farewell addresses that we could look at. I, the, the other one I'll share with you, I wasn't there. Um, but my mother-in-law was. Barb grew up in a church that she only knew one pastor growing up. Uh, George Linhart, Dr. Linhart, was the pastor of Grace Chapel for more than 30 years. And when he retired, he, he went out into a retirement community in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, called Willow Valley. And some of you may have heard of Willow Valley. Uh, Pete and Carol Bambi, who were here for, for a number of years, uh, that's where they've retired to. Um, a large retirement community. But Dr. Linhart, like many of the people from the church, retired out into this retirement center. And, and uh, he became a, a chaplain. Uh, just using his skills and his abilities. And um, certainly he had a care and a compassion for, for all the folks. He wasn't the only chaplain, but, but particularly the people from, from the church that he had ministered to over the years. On one occasion, he, he had a gathering of all the folks from the church who we're out at Willow Valley. He, they gathered in a large meeting room. 
and he began to, to give them an address. And in that address to them, he said, I want you to remember what I've taught you all these years. I want you to remember the things that faithfully, the things that are true of God's word and we've taught. I want you to remember Christ. I want you to remember the gospel. I want you to do, fight for the gospel. I want you to live out the reality of the gospel in your life. That was the essence of his address to the people. Dr. Linhart didn't walk out of that meeting. At the end of his address, he collapsed and died. They carried him out of the meeting. He said, I wasn't there, I, but I, my mother-in-law was. Made an indelible impression upon her that she shared. Farewell addresses can have that kind of impression. You need to understand that probably this letter to Timothy is Timothy is a farewell address from Paul to Timothy. Timothy, we know, was a companion of Paul. He was on Paul's missionary journey, that is, he was going into Lystra, and there in Lystra, that the people of Lystra spoke highly of this young man. They spoke highly, good character, a sense of giftedness. They recommended him to Paul. He joined Paul's apostolic band, and probably for maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 years was associated with Paul. So when we think of Timothy as a young man, Understand, we tend to always say, well, he was 20 years old. Or, no, no, Timothy was older than that. Okay. Uh, young is relative. We were with the Micklouches yesterday for Rich's father's funeral. His father was 100 years old. Okay. I'm young. <laughs> Paul this associate with him is probably in the neighborhood of 20 years. By the time Paul is writing to Timothy in this letter, Timothy is in his 40s, maybe 50. We know from what we've looked at is, is that Paul, in the end of the book of Acts, uh, Paul had been arrested. Paul was taken to Rome. He was placed under house arrest. That is called Paul's first imprisonment. Oh, that first imprisonment, he wrote letters like Ephesians and Philippians, Colossians and Philemon. But we, we, tradition and history tells us that he, he was released. Whether he was ever fully acquitted, we don't know, but, but he was released from prison, and he traveled. And we know that he traveled because there are letters in the New Testament, like 1 Timothy, where Paul left Timothy and, in Ephesus. We know from Titus that he left Titus in Crete. And so Paul was traveling in probably Asia Minor again and other places. And some speculation is that he did indeed make it all the way to Spain. But he was arrested again uh, and this time placed into prison in Rome by Nero. This time not to come out alive, but Paul was martyred, we think probably by beheading. Uh, somewhere around the year 64, 65 A.D. And this letter is what he's writing to Timothy. And he's asking Timothy to come from Ephesus and join him there for these last moments. We don't know uh, whether Timothy actually got there in time or not, but this letter teaches us a lot about these last words. And so as I thought about this morning and said, okay, we're here in 2 Timothy, there, there are tremendous truths in, across this letter, four chapters for us, that we could spend a lot of time in. But how do you do it in one Sunday? And what is it that we might glean from this? And so I've chosen the theme of a farewell address. What can I learn from 
Paul's farewell address that I might apply to my life and the idea of passing it on to the next generation in my family, those in my sphere of influence. And so I want to summarize, if you'll allow, just two main ideas that I think Paul included in this farewell address to Timothy that he wanted him, a beloved son, a son in the faith, to make sure that he heard, that he, he knew, and it was a challenge to carry on. Two. The first would be this. Remember your calling. Remember your calling. There are two types of calling, I think, that we're going to be talking about. The first is a calling with regards to salvation. Paul, when he writes to, to Timothy, he said, Look, but don't be ashamed. I'm suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, and accord, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose, his grace, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. That farewell address begins with a remember your calling, particularly with regards to salvation. And there's some things about this calling that we need to at least uh, recognize and understand. If there is a calling, there's a caller. If I had my phone up here and I took it out and I wanted to call, I would take it out and punch in numbers and call someone. Or my phone would ring and I would answer a call. In the first case, I am the caller. In the second case, someone else is a caller. But to be a caller means that they are initiating the call. That the call of God with regards to our salvation, we begin with at least understanding this, that God is the initiator of our salvation. Without him calling us, we would never respond. Or we would never call him. The scriptures, Paul has made a number of, uh, of references or pictures of what our state was. He said, we're dead. We're dead in our sins, dead in our trespasses, and I hope I could say this rather assertively, that none of us have ever received a call from a dead person. At least I hope so. <laughs> Paul says there's none who seeks after God. So unless God calls us, we would never seek him. And so Paul reminds Timothy of the grace of God, that God initiated the call of salvation in Timothy's life, and Timothy responded by faith. He saved us, he called us with a holy calling. It's a calling that is set apart, he says, even from eternity. God's design, God's purpose, is because it's according to his own purpose. When Paul wrote to the Ephesians and other churches, he reminded them early on that, that that salvation is according to grace, but it's to the praise of his glory. To the praise of the glory of the grace of God, who works all things after the counsel of his will. It's for his sovereign purpose. And God doesn't always make those things very clear or known to us. But at least we know that this purpose is for his glory and to the glory of his grace. And this salvation is granted to us through a person. 
It is granted to us in Christ Jesus. That apart from Christ Jesus, there's no salvation. The good news of the gospel is centered in this person, Jesus of Nazareth, who is identified as the Messiah, the Christ. He's identified as the one that God has designated as a redeemer and a savior and a king. And so this salvation, this calling has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has granted his life. So the first thing he would say to Timothy is I want you to remember your calling, and that is your salvation is a gift that has been granted to you by God through Christ Jesus. But then this idea of calling extends beyond that. This idea of calling extends to what I'll say is a life purpose. A couple of weeks ago, I, I uh, referenced and quoted from an author in a book dealing with the idea of deception and lies and spin by, by an author by the name of Os Guinness. Uh, I enjoy reading Os Guinness and actually working through a, another of his books right now with some, some men here at church. And the title of that book is The Call. And it deals with this idea of calling. Because sometimes we, we may think that, that the idea of calling is, is me, is what I do. It's vocational ministry or our missions. And he once says, no, no, it's much more than that. Let me give you his definition of calling. He says, calling is the truth that God calls us to himself so decisively that everything we are, everything we do, everything we have is invested with a special devotion and dynamism lived out as a response to his summons and service. Everything we are Everything we do, everything we have, living out in response to the caller. And I see that here in Paul's letter to Timothy. Now, certainly Timothy, you can think of him in vocational ministry, but extend it beyond that. Verse 6, he says, For this reason I remind you afresh to, to stir up this gift of God. that you have a, an enablement from God. Now for Timothy, he said this enablement, this gifting was, came on with the laying on of hands. First Timothy reminds us that it was also with the, with the elders of the church and through prophetic utterance, that is, that they recognized the gifting and divine enablement in Timothy's life, and they set him apart and sent him on with Paul. That calling extends even to God's preparation of us. That there's a divine enablement for you and for me. God has gifted us. God is, if he's called you with regards to salvation, then God has also enabled you through his spirit. The gift. That's to be used and exercised. Stir it up. Not only this idea of giftedness. For Timothy, he had a responsibility as a steward of the gift and that which had been entrusted to him. So you get to verse 13, and he says, Retain the standard of sound words which you've heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit the deposit, the treasure which has been entrusted to you. We're stewards of what God has granted us. We're to retain it, guard it, share it. In Timothy's case, teach it. 
but that which God has worked in us. Everything we are, everything we have, comes from the great Father of lights. He's granted that to us. We are to be stewards of all that God has done in preparing and shaping us to be the people that God designs us to be. He even used his parents. You notice that? And grandparents. God was working to prepare Timothy to be the kind of person and entrusted him and gifted him. It's not just vocational ministry. Tim, Paul, and if he were writing to us in a general sense, would say to you, remember your calling. Because God has worked in you. And God has prepared you uniquely. You know, I look around this room and you're all different. You all look different. But it's not just appearance. God has shaped and prepared each of us in this room uniquely. The experiences, our backgrounds, all of those things that he's built into our life are all those things that are good gifts from God to shape us, to prepare us. And he's entrusted us with that. Yeah, I look at my own children, the five of them. None of them are in Christian ministry. So that's okay. God has gifted them and built into them, even though they have the same parents, uniquely. The strengths and weaknesses. My word to them would be, remember your calling, your life purpose. God has prepared you uniquely for a purpose. For his good purpose. For his glory, his name. When I understand that I'm a steward, and they're stewards of the way God has prepared them, there's something very important we all need to remember. Paul reminds Timothy that there's accountability. When there is that which is entrusted, there is accountability. Paul reminds even to the point of chapter 4 in verse 1 I solemnly charge in the presence of God in Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and dead by his appearing verse 8 in the future there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day not only to me but all those who loved his appearing hey if God has done this, and God has entrusted it to you, understand that you're going to give an account for it one day. Accountability will be before a righteous judge. And the test of that judgment is faithfulness. It's faithfulness. Moreover, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, it is required of the Lord's steward that he be found faithful. Remember your call, both in the salvation and in your purpose in life. That God has granted you the gift. God has granted you all things to be who you are, what you have, what you do. To give an account. 
the second charge I would give, and it runs throughout this letter, I'll use the word is persevere. Persevere. Despite what many think is a privileged life, or ought to be a life of ease and a life of comfort, we need to make sure that the next generation understands that life is not a bed of roses. Life is difficult. And life comes with challenges. Particularly if you're a believer. Paul is writing this from prison. He's suffering in prison. He's going to die for the cause of Christ. And he writes to Timothy and he says, Timothy, don't quit. Don't jump ship. Don't go AWOL like some have. And he calls them out. He says, persevere. Listen, it is in this text that that he says, all those who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. All those who desire to live in response to the gospel. Now, we're not, we're not trying to, to say, look, we want everybody to develop a martyr complex. That's not what we're doing. But we need to understand that the difficulty of life, particularly as a believer, how you will live your life willing to suffer for the name of Christ. Persevere. Well, how do you do that? You remember the enablement that God has given you. He's a provider. Chapter 1, he says, look, verse 7, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but instead he's given us a spirit of power and love and discipline. The ability to, to persevere is still granted by God through a divine enablement. But there's something greater. Because even though we should look at his provision, what he calls Timothy to is to make sure he fixes his eyes on the provider. For this reason I suffer, verse 12. I'm not ashamed, for I know whom. Notice, it's not I know what I've believed. It's I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed. And I'm absolute. there's a, there's a gospel song that, that we may have sung or you may have sung in the past, which gives this refrain. For I know, I may not know how or why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, or why unworthy sinners he did indeed pour out his grace to me. But this I know, but I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to guard that which I've committed to him against that day. I may not have all the answers and I may not know why, but I know who. And that's what he's calling him to. Persevere because of who is the provider. And in the middle of chapter 2 is one of these statements again, whether it's a hymn or some kind of a creedal statement again. He says, this is a trustworthy statement. This is what you can bank on. If we died with him, we live with him. If we endure, we'll reign with him. If we deny him, he'll deny us. If we're faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. The perseverance through the tests of life is not just focusing on what God has provided. More importantly, it is focusing on who the provider is. And with that, it's what he's provided, but it's a reflection of who he is is we have the scriptures.
chapter 3, verse 12, indeed all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted and things are going to get from bad to worse. But you, verse 14, however, continue in the things you've learned and become convinced and that from childhood you've known the sacred writings which are able to make you wise into salvation. All scripture is inspired of God, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness. The man of God may be thoroughly prepared, thoroughly equipped, thoroughly adequate for every good work. You persevere because God has provided divine enablement and certainly, but he's looking to the provider, but it is the scriptures that is the provision and the picture and the revelation of the provider. Persevere. Endure. Endure. In chapter 2, he, he gives three pictures. He says, uh, endure hardship as a good soldier. Compete as an athlete. Be a good farmer. You endure. Yeah, yesterday as we were driving up to Chicago, driving through farmlands, plowed farmlands. You know what they all had in common? Most of them had in common? A lot of water sitting on them. And as we drove by, we said, I hope they haven't planted already. Because if they've planted, they're not getting any crops. Endure hardship even as a farmer who has to endure that. For today, running down at, in Cincinnati, all those, go, 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 you can do it. Competing as an athlete to finish and endure 26 Point two miles. I'm going to put a sticker in the back of ours. My favorite sticker, I think, of all time. You know what it says? 0, 0. <laughs> uh, Seven years ago, I preached at, at ACA's graduation the first time. And I preached 2 Timothy chapter 2 endure hardship as a good soldier. And I used as an illustration Marcus Luttrell's work, Lone Survivor. Endurance. Perseverance. I think the words I want to give to my children would be, remember your calling. Persevere. Persevere. If you allow, remain faithful. Maybe this week that would be an assignment for us all. I'll say to dads, but maybe to all. Sometimes we sit down, and as I'd like to think about this week, maybe putting it in writing to each one. They say, well, I've got time. I'm young. Young's relative but you don't know how much time you have and neither do I. But maybe sit down and write out a farewell address. What is it that I would want to pass on to my children and my grandchildren? An encouragement to them. Those things that they have heard and seen and hopefully learned from me that now I'm passing on to faithful men and women who will in turn be able to teach others also. Maybe that's an exercise we can all do this week. Write it down. Farewell address. 
to tell them to remember and to persevere.